Good day once again, fellow learners. This is your mentor, your fact check buddy, joining you for set number 44 for our next generation NPLEX RN pointers. And let's begin. Before we get to start, I'd like to ask for your support for this mission, which we have started two years ago, and we've done this successfully in the past two years. May I ask you to help us achieve our goal to provide free NCLEX RN application and review to 100 nurses. We were able to do this for the past two years, and to help us achieve this, just watch and finish the ads in our videos. Thank you very much in advance for doing so. Now, let's begin our pointer set number 44. So the first question that you have to ask yourselves if you are preparing for the next generation NPLEX RN is, what do I have to study? And the things that we consider as trends are changing very, every so often. So it's very important on your end to get an expert opinion. And when we say expert opinion, not those false gurus of the N next generation NPLEX RN. It's not as if you took the test, pass it, and you're already an expert. No, you have to be mentored by people who are professionals, who are trained to help you out, and who possess the heart and the mind and the patience to enable you to reach your goal. So we are here, Ray Gapos Review System family, to help you out. So let's begin your journey for this learning and teaching session. So as you can see in the picture, uh, this is about phototherapy. Now, when you speak of phototherapy, primarily the use is in order to treat neonatal jaundice. We know for a fact that when jaundice occurs within the first 24 hours after birth of the fetus, it could simply mean that there is RH or blood incompatibility. So you need to refer that immediately to the physician. However, if the jaundice occurs on the, se on the second day and it lasts for a couple of days or two weeks, then that is physiologic jaundice. So if you have a preterm infant who is below 35 weeks gestation, phototherapy is started when the bilirubin level is greater than five times the birth weight. What does that mean? For example, if you have a one kilogram neonate and um, if you are asked when should they be starting your phototherapy, it should start when the bilirubin level of the client is at five milligrams per deciliter. However, for a two kilogram neonate, phototherapy should be started when the bilirubin level is at 10 milligrams per deciliter. So take note, phototherapy is it started when the bilirubin level is greater than five times the birth weight, okay? So for one kilogram baby, you start phototherapy when the bilirubin level is at five milligrams per deciliter. If you have a two kilogram baby, so you start phototherapy when the bilirubin level is at 10 milligrams per deciliter. Now, the next important thing that you have to note is... Um, the strength of the light that is used in phototherapy. So it's usually 20 watts um, fluorescent bulbs, and the distance could be 10 to 15 centimeters. Some literatures would say 30 to 40 centimeters above the infant. But there are literatures that say that the phototherapy light should be as near as possible to the baby. Now, what are the common side effects? Well, there could be redness or skin rashes. It's not a cause for alarm. So there's going to be loose tools. So we need to continuously feed the baby. And we need to protect the eyes and pay particular attention to this. Drugs that may develop phototoxic reactions for the baby while they are on phototherapy should be avoided. And these drugs could be your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents like ibuprofen, your tetracycline, uh, your diuretics like furosemide. So another potential side effect of phototherapy could be your Brown's baby syndrome. So don't worry, the darkening of the skin that occurs in this condition is transient and it goes away. So 
It's also very important for you to monitor the temperature as well as the number of wet diapers that the baby had during treatment. Now, it's important to note that if a baby is in a f um, undergoing phototherapy, feeding should continue, but it's inappropriate when you remove the baby from the bassinet and the phototherapy just to feed him or her. So it's important to feed the baby while they're undergoing phototherapy. Okay, so let's move on. Here's one exchange with one of our passers. We have Rosalyn. I believe she's African. Hello, Sir Ray. I'm writing this with a lot of excitement. I just passed my NCLEX exam and I say, wow, congratulations. I asked her which part of a review helped you the most. Thank you so much, sir. You have walked me throughout this journey and I cannot find words to say how grateful I am to you and your entire team. Miss Cherry, Sir Francis, Miss McLean, I am so happy. So remember to always believe that you can and you will. Next, let's talk about colostomy irrigation. So if you notice, we have your picture of the colostomy stoma. This is a normal stoma. It's edematous. It's moist. It's pinkish. Now, when the stoma becomes purplish or bluish, that could mean that there's inadequate circulation. And um, note that the stoma should be periodically dilated to prevent the development of strictures and Pay particular attention to the fact that we need to irrigate the colostomy. And when colostomy irrigation is done, you have to prepare the necessary tools for performing the procedure. So definitely you need 500 ml to 1,500 ml of tap water. And then the position of the patient would depend on whether you're going to do the irrigation while the patient if the patient is bedridden or if the patient is going to be seated on the toilet bowl or to be seated on a chair near the toilet bowl. So in which case you have to position the patient um, upright. So instruct the client to sit upright and take note, you need to insert six to eight inches of your um, tube into the stoma such that the fluid would flow from your colostomy irrigating solution bag or container directly into the colon. And make sure that if the patient is seated, take a look at the level of the irrigating solution. It should be at the level of the client's shoulder, okay? Or not more than 18 to 20 inches above the shoulders. Otherwise, that could lead to very, very rapid infusion of the irrigating solution, and that could lead to cramping of the abdomen. Remember, abdominal cramping could be related to um, very fast um, um, discarding of the irrigating solution, or it could be associated with uh, too much air in the system, or it could be that the irrigating solution is very cold. So it's very important for you to note that these things impact the administration of your um, colostomy irrigation solution. So in order for the uh, infusion of the irrigating solution to be at an acceptable rate, you have to ensure that the height of your irrigating solution the container of the irrigating solution should not be beyond 18 to 20 inches above the shoulders. Or if the patient is lying on bed, then you can have it 12 to 18 inches from the stomach. If cramps occur, stop the solution and wait for the cramps to disappear. If it disappears, then you can continue. But if it doesn't, then stop the procedure altogether. Now, there are certain conditions that contraindicates colostomy irrigation, and this includes your irritable bowel syndrome or the presence of diverticulitis or diverticulosis or when there's irradiation of the bowels. Now, how frequent should colostomy irrigation be done? It should be done at least once daily or at the same time every day as when the patient would usually move their bowels. Or sometimes it could also be done um, every two to three days. Okay. Now, 
Let me share with you our passers from all over the world who've gone through our system, including a 60-year-old who passed the test last year and all of these nurses who all passed the test to our system. Next, let's talk about grief and grieving. Okay, now when you say grief, it's, it's the emotional reaction to a loss and that emotional reaction is normal. Remember, there is no specific timetable for grieving resolution. You need to focus on time. You need to focus on social support and the healthy habits, including the mental health of the person who is grieving. Now, what I'd like you to remember for the next generation and clicks is how would you know that the person has already recovered from grieving? One, the patient is able to get rid of the loved one's things, meaning they can now let go of clothes or shoes of the disease, and they don't feel any emotional pain anymore. They're ready to face the loss. They acknowledge it, they accept it, and they can talk about the loss in a comfortable manner. So what interventions would help the grieving client cope? So there are three C's. The first one is choose. Since grieving is a subjective experience, then you ask the client, what interventions do they think would work for them? And then you empower them to do these interventions. Second is you ask them to connect, meaning they have to reach out and get the support that they need from friends, family, and loved ones. And third, communicate. They need to tell others what they feel. They need to tell others what they need. So remember the three Zs as the primary interventions for the grieving client. You have choose, connect, and communicate. Okay. And so therefore, let's move on to the next question. How do you study for the NGN? Now you have to have the right learning tools. Here at the Regapo system, we begin with this small book, which is very useful for those who are studying for select all that apply items or multiple choice with multiple response items because everything is in mnemonic form. So it's called nursing reminder sheet. And then we also have our quick fix in pharmacology. It comes in full color. Okay. And definitely I am guiding them on how to use this book. And of course, a lot of nurses refer to this book as the holy grail of passing engine. NCLEX 311, which is the Philippine edition of my book, which is published in the U.S. It's called NCLEX RN in a Flash in the U.S., published by Johnson Bartlett. But this time around, I'd like to share with you the local publish, uh, publication of that same book here in the Philippines. It's entitled NCLEX 311. Okay. So if you want to have copies of our learning tools, please visit our store at Shopee and you can order from there. And of course, let me share with you a feedback. I asked Jasmine Abella, who's also a passer, which part of our review helped you the most? And she says, sir, the bootcamp. Now, the bootcamp is a 10-day face-to-face class that I conduct here in Baguio City. It's being done at the Mount Grace Hotel. So what she says, grabi po yung mental preparation ng bootcamp, mga brain cells talaga po, gagana. Swak po siya sa short preparation for the exam. So what she's practically saying is, it's really the test preparation of choice if you want a shorter period of time to prepare for the test because the mental preparations during the camp really stimulated her brain cells. And then she says, binasa ko rin po yung 311 and yung core shell. Well, she used NCLEX 311, once again, my book, and pinaka nag-enjoy po ako sa bootcamp. Okay, she enjoyed the bootcamp the most. Sir, marami po standalone questions. Mas sandalian po ako sa case study dahil nasa nyo kami sa ganun. Lahat po ng case study ko na may naka-incorporate po na matrix, marami po ako prioritization. So what she's practically saying is, well, it was easy for her to navigate um, case studies because she learned a lot of strategies from our system. And there are a lot of questions that, in that are in matrix form or 
concepts that covered prioritization that are integrated into her case studies. Okay, so this is the core shells that she's talking about. So the core shells contains all subjects on the test, safety and infection control, basic care and comfort, health promotion, maintenance, management of care, uh, pharmacological and parenteral therapies, physiological adaptation one, two, and three, and of course, reduction of risk potential and psychosocial integrity. So the core shells covers all the subject areas on the test, okay? And the third requisite, if you want to prepare for your NGN, would be to be in a conducive environment. At the Regapo system, we have a very conducive class, face-to-face -face class during the bootcamp, and of course, we're the only one with an NGN simulation room. Okay, so may I invite you to join us for next generation NCLEX RN Flex, the most flexible test prep class for the NCLEX RN. Your choice of live face-to-face -face class, live virtual class, on-demand and limited video recorded lessons, QBank, and of course, my three books. Okay, including your nursing reminder sheet. And the fee starts at 3499 it also would give you the opportunity to join me on a face-to-face -face quick fix session. That's going to be three sessions and conducted in three days. So we have AM weekdays and PM on weekend classes. All schedules are covered. So if you may want to join us anytime within the week or during weekends, please do so. So once again, this is your mentor, your fact check by Derek Gapus at your service saying a functional concept a day keeps your NCLEX RN fears away. See you in our next video.